We are live and uh, should be recording as well. So hello, everyone. I uh, hope you can hear us. This is our, our first live event here on uh, AirMeet, testing this out. And uh, we're working through some technical issues, as you can surmise. Uh, good. So people at least can hear us. Hopefully you can see us. <laughs> Give us a thumbs up if you can see us as well. Uh, we'd appreciate that, or at least a text in the, that. Okay, there we go. Yes, um, Lane was having some internet connectivity issues, which are unpredictable. Um, we've had this problem before on Discord, and now on this program, AirMeet. Usually it works really fine with him on Zoom, so it, it, it's perplexing trying to understand what the issue is, but we're trying to get him connected, um, and hopefully we will be able to fit him in here. Oh, he's on the phone. <laughs> he's saying he's almost there. Yeah, on the on the on Zoom on his telephone instead or on his smartphone instead of on. Uh, maybe I can patch the video in through that. This is this is turning into a circus, but we're gonna see what we can wow. do here. I wish we I wish we could see everybody's face. Is there a way for me to do that? Uh, well, you you maybe work not. on that while I work on this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't want I want to add another layer to layer. <laughs> Um, well, I enjoyed the uh, round table. I got thrown into a, some good conversations. Oh, did you, yeah, you did the uh, express speed networking? I did that, and then I yeah. joined a table. That's cool. That was great. Hopefully that, yeah. It's it's fun. It's a little experiment. This is our first time using this app. I mean, we have did some tests, and they worked fine. Of course, they worked fine when you do a test. <laughs> but But then when we did something else... Not fine. Um, so here, uh, he's trying to connect. I'm getting text messages from him. He says he's almost there. Um, so, Carlton, why don't we just start talking about the book while Lane's not here? We can say what we think. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and then Let's we'll move. It. We'll move on into into whatever else we got going on. As soon as Lane connects, then we can start taking answers or uh, fielding questions and providing answers. Hopefully. Um, getting this to work at uh, ASAP. So Carlton, when, you know, we've got the book yeah. here. Of course, the book uh, we're talking about tonight is uh, The Trinitarian Theology of Cornelius Van Til, uh, published by Reformed Forum this year. It's our latest offering, and uh, it's been a work uh, un in progress for, for many, many years, but uh, it's actually out. And now we're thankful that you wrote the foreword and now are able to join us today. But uh, Carlton, what are some of your impressions, and what are you thinking about this evening after having had the book for a few weeks? I'm just encouraged that um, word about the book is getting around. Uh, I sent you a screenshot just about an hour ago of a little post I saw from Reformation Heritage Books uh, talking about the book and saying Van Til was a preeminent theologian who's steering us back to a orthodox doctrine of God and just just encouraged to see that uh, happening. Um, I think the book's content, as I mentioned to you in a previous recording, even surpasses the aesthetics. I just love the way the book looks and just the, you know, the publication dimensions of the book and mm -hmm. endorsements and stuff. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to hear from some of the folks that are with us tonight to hear their impressions of the book, because you and I know Lane's voice so well. Yeah. just from years of interaction mm -hmm. and I hear his voice coming through and the way that he writes mm -hmm. and it's I'm guessing for many people it's unlike other kind of books like he's just dropping bomb after bomb in in his theological prose and so I'm I'm curious to know what people think about the content of the book and the way that the material is presented Mm -hmm. Because in the in the train of Van Til, sometimes maybe he he makes some theological moves that people have to think about, reflect on. Um, it's not just served up on a silver platter. Right. Sometimes, mm -hmm. um, so I'm 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 anxious to hear. But I I love it. I reread it. Um, the final chapter. I thought was one of the best things oh. about the book as he turns it toward apologetics. Absolutely. And uh, that's just um, 
I'm teaching apologetics right now at RTS. In fact, I had class today, and uh, and and we got to cover Van Til's line about being Suave Terran Moto Forty Terran <laughs> Ring. So, as I was talking about that today, this afternoon, I was thinking about the seal on this book, mm. and um, sent the link to my class. And I think uh, I've only I've only got initials here, lists of people, but. I think a student from class was going to log in. Oh, that's good. So thankful for that. Yeah, it's interesting yeah, to think and, about those sorts of things. I haven't read the RHB article yet. I look forward to seeing that. Thanks for sending me a note. I've been uh, a little preoccupied, but uh, we'll get to that soon enough. But I'm curious, uh, was it a book review, more like a book notice? Uh, it was just uh, selling the book. Yeah. Oh, nice. And a little yeah. puff. Yeah. That would make sense. Just we sent puff. them. We sent them a couple cases. I think <laughs> they bought a couple cases oh, okay. from us. Well, so they, they're stocking they their bookstore it now. So. Mm-hmm. Very good. They definitely want to sell it. Um, okay, here I'll read it to you. It says in the Trinitarian theology of Van Til, and it's sideways on my screen here. Lane Tipton <laughs> looks to one of the, mo- the Lane Tipton looks to one of the modern Reformation's greatest theologians, Cornelius Van Til. Tipton ably demonstrates that Van Til was not only a master at apologetics, but also a faithful Trinitarian scholar. The Reformed Church finds itself at a crossroads where classical Reformed theism is being challenged within its ranks. Let Van Til be the voice that steers us back on course. Yeah, hey, good for them. Link. Yeah, we didn't uh, even write that for them. <laughs> I know. <laughs> How nice is that? Hey, Dr. T. Welcome to the program, Lane. We're talking I about your book. The connection holds. It's good to be here. Yeah. There might yeah. be a way for you, possibly. Was that Renton's uh, summary? No, that was uh, from. Renton was posting the Reformation Heritage books. Like that's the advertisement. Bookstore. Yeah, that's the Reformation Heritage bookstore description of the volume. Oh, wow. Now, Lane, for uh, technical go. sake, Beautiful. at the bottom of your screen, you probably have a little HD icon. That might be something you can hit to switch into low def mode. That might help uh, at least yes, some of the technical problems. Uh, there's also a you know a little button that says facing problems question mark. I don't know what happens if you click that, but <laughs> maybe they send a squad. Anyway, yeah, we'll get this working. Uh, the HD. Definitely get off the HD. Low def mode, high so def content. So I am low def. Okay. I'm low def mode. Well, hopefully high we can still content. hear you okay. and still get the outline of, of your being. I think your essence is still coming through. <laughs> <laughs> but not your, not your accidents. Not your accidents. Brother, the form is coming th- The matter is coming the through, subs- but not the form. The substance, not the accidents. Well, while we have you, oh, while this is working, yeah. and we'll, we'll do everything we can uh, folks uh, for the next event to, to try to do this. We did do a test. We did a test and it worked. We did so, it and it was, it was perfect. Yeah, we're going we're, we're, we're gonna to get to the bottom of this because this happened with some of our cohorts as well. But uh, let us uh, let me start off by saying that everyone, if you have any questions, um, maybe if we have time toward the end, we can allow people to raise their hand. Or we can bring people up on stage. I hope that we can do that. But for the moment, if you find there should be a tab where you see the um, the uh, chat room, there's another tab for Q&A. So if you have any questions, uh, please post them there. I'll try to keep tabs on those and, and uh, be able to uh, follow along with what's going on with the questions and seek to, to submit those over to uh, Lane. So here we go. This is the place to post questions. Okay, so I'm learning. So you can, we can comment on those questions, and it looks like I can from – the questions that you post, I can promote you to the stage so that you can uh, ask your question in person. So you can prompt it here, and then I can bring you up, and then you can ask the question and interact with with us, with Lane in particular, if you'd like. But um, let's start off, Lane. You know that's been a couple of weeks. So uh, you know we we know we've generally had a good, solid, and encouraging response to this book. We've sold uh, more than a sixth of our stock already, so we're really happy for that. Looking forward to moving more of this. Uh, uh, we've been getting requests from libraries who've been buying it, as well as requests for review copies in various journals. So it's already making some moves in terms of people wanting to discuss it. But maybe what 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 are your hopes uh, for this book? Uh, you know, what 
already I think it's been a, a success by any standards I had. But in terms of what would you like to see, Lane, in terms of people discussing Van Til and approaching this volume? What are your hopes for it in that regard? Well, my my hopes are that people will recognize Van Til offered something in the history of the 20th century that is very unique and very important in the 21st century. And that is he, he set forth an integrated doctrinal conception of classical reformed Trinitarianism and classical reformed federalism over against all forms of correlativism, whether ancient or modern. And he carved out something that helps us as reformed Christians express why we are reformed, confessionally reformed, and not traditional Roman Catholics, and not modernists of any variety, much less the dialectical modernism of Bart. And my hope is that I, I really don't know what my goals are short term. Mm -hmm. I'm a bit pessimistic by nature about short term impact. My goal is, my hope is that this book and the sorts of things we're doing at Reform Forum um, are as, if not more useful, 10, 25, 50 years from now as today. And, and, and hopefully we'll recognize that Van Til's contribution his integration of Reformed Trinitarianism and Federalism uh, really cuts a path for us, blazes a trail for us to retain our distinctively Reformed theological identity in a rigorous and robust way that can engage in conversation across the boards. So I'm hoping it will have that kind of impact, but I, I guess I'm thinking a little bit more long-term and a little bit more down the road, I guess, on one level. Yeah. Carlton, you have any thoughts? I uh, you know you've been thinking about the this book and even preparing for our conversation this evening. I'm curious if you have anything queued up. Yeah, I I think one of the great strengths of the book that I think um, is relatively new is the way that Lane integrates Trinitarian theology with redemptive history, and we do a lot in the Vossian tradition with with the diachronic unfolding of the plan of redemption. We talk about typology. We, we even, with Klein's influence, talk about the, the, the role of heaven and the intrusion of heavenly power and life through the person and work of Christ. But to situate, if we can put it this way, and I know a lot of guys are going to sympathize with this, Voss's triangle, if we can integrate that with the two circles of Van Til, with the creator-creature distinction and relation, then We've got not only a horizontal trajectory, but we've got a vertical trajectory that is equally basic, and uh, and and that's the stuff of, um, you know when you know when Voss says in uh, I guess it's in the Pauline eschatology that to see God as the source and end of all things is not only uh, not only stands related to theology like the fruit stands to the tree, but becomes in its essence a veritable theological tree of life. Uh, He's, he's talking about biblical theology opening up the right theological questions, and I think the way that Lane integrates the creator-creature distinction and relation and redemptive history in terms of covenant is like a, its own veritable theological tree of mm -hmm. life. It just opens up vistas of wonderful theological questions that we can ask for many years to come. Yeah. I think a lot of things come together, too, with this uh, book. Um in terms of the present moment, I'm going to bring up our friend Adam Estella, who's who's issued a question here, and uh, Lane Lane knows Adam. Lane has uh, the his glory torch from Adam, I believe. So I'm going to yes. we're going to attempt this tech, Adam, and uh, I suppose this you is, could this is so cool. You Wait, could decline. So oh, interesting. Okay, so I can I invite up. Adam to the stage if he so <laughs> desires. We'll see. Can he like follow up with his own voice? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's the that's the goal. That. That's what we're hoping that oh, okay, he would okay. be able to. Uh, Oh, that's a that's an Ostella like question right there. And then I, Adam, I, know that I think from anywhere. I know. Cool. So the question's right there. But then Adam, I think you need to. Oh, I see your video. Very good. So the question, uh, Adam, can you can you speak? Can we hear you? You there? Uh, I don't know. Can you? hear Yeah, me? we can. Very good. <laughs> hey, brother. Nice. Nice. It's, it's working. This, 
Yeah, this is such a great event. Thanks for putting it out. I know it's a lot of work to do this kind of stuff, but I think this book is so, so important and we need to like, uh, you know, get, get these, uh, these issues out there and get these questions out there. So my question specifically was just, it's kind of a broad one, maybe just a general one, maybe just to try to get some conversation going specifically about what jumped out of me a lot was just kind of being puzzled again as to why correlativism and mutualism has gained traction at all among any reformed thinker, just given like the heart of what our reformed tradition has taught, especially in the, in the Westminster standard. Now that's more, that's the more general way of putting it. I think I could be a little bit more specific. Uh, I have concerns about what's happening in the thought of the correlativists and the mutualists uh, as it pertains to the creator creature distinction. I just don't see how it can be logically maintained. And honestly, I don't know what happens to attributes of eternity and and immutability if we're going to say that God in his being somehow takes on properties not otherwise proper to himself uh, in order to relate to creation. So I'll just throw it out like that. Thanks, Adam. Brother, great question. Great to see you, by the way. Um, the I've got I mentioned this uh, about a couple of weeks ago to someone who asked me a similar question. And I, my mind is taken back, Adam, to around 1995 when um, I was at Westminster Seminary out in California, and John Frame published an essay, 94-95, in the Westminster Theological Journal entitled Something Close to Biblicism. Now, I'm not saying that Frame is an outright unqualified um, unreconstructed biblicist, because the definition of biblicism, as I uh, view it, is uh, reading scripture and drawing theological conclusions that are independent of and run contrary to the way the scriptures have been interpreted and summarized in the ecumenical creeds and the Reformed confessions. But Frame said that. He, he put that out there, something close to biblicism. And just a few years later, in his uh, No Other God, and then just a few years after that, mid-90s, No Other God, 2002, his Doctrine of God, the next thing you know, he's saying that on the basis of biblical texts that say that God relates to time, we must posit two modes of existence, an eternal, a temporal mode when he's not related, a historical mode when he is related. And in that historical mode frame is explicit that God changes. And so what I think, Adam, uh, what I think happens is that within certain quarters of the Reformed tradition, frame is an excellent example. You have, and I'll just use his own language, something close to biblicism that enables something Ex- identical to mutualism. So something close to biblicism entails something identical to mutualism, and it's that combination, that kind of trajectory that you uh, that you see in Frame, you see it in other people, uh, more recent volumes, uh, the, the God With Us Project and so on. But th- that's, uh, th- that I think is what happens. There's such a desire to be biblical that the the biblical text is read in a way that is not conformed to, not um, in touch with, not expressive of the way the scriptures have been interpreted in the creeds and the confessions. And you wind up, ironically, in the name of the Bible, denying what the Catholic, Lord KC, and Reformed tradition has uniformly and without variation, as far as I can see, confessed, namely that the creator-creature distinction— God is immutable, Mm -hmm. passable, simple, apart from creation, is maintained at every point in the relation. So it's, it's, that's my, that's an intuitive um, answer with a concrete example to it, Adam. And I, it, it, I think, I think we're, that something close to biblicism's something close to the right answer. Yeah, you just preempted another question that we had, uh, and it's a good question. Okay. What is biblicism? And uh, yeah, just just to put a point on it, you answered it there. And uh, the asker, Kason, if I'm getting that, if I'm getting it right, uh, he already acknowledged that. Never mind, <laughs> he just answered. But it's reading the Bible in a in a way that's independent of our creeds and confessions, or independent of the way that the church has read and understood it. Uh, you know, there's all there's all sorts of other varieties of it too, but um, that that basically, in a nutshell, is what we're talking about. 
Camden, can I offer up one little Please. thought that comes to mind in addition to what Lane said? And I'm Lane, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Adam, you too. Um, I think, you know, many of us will have Bavinck's Reform Dogmatics on the shelf. And volume two starts with that famous line, mystery is the lifeblood of dogmatics. And the perennial challenge of systematic theology is to draw the right lines where that mystery lies and, and hold the biblical truths as we think God's thoughts after him together. And, and the, the, the temptation of the human heart is to resolve those mysteries in a rationalistic way. And when it comes to the God-world relation, you got one of two options. Either you humanize God or you deify man. Those are the two rationalistic options that our human heart is craving uh, for in order to in order to capture the mystery of the God world relation within categories we can understand. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's just one iteration of the way you know heresies have plagued the church. How can God, how can Christ be one person with two natures? Well, he can't, so we posit he's two persons, or we posit Eutychianism, or we posit, you know, any kind of Christological heresy to right. resolve the mystery of the incarnation. And I think a similar thing happens when it comes to the God world relation. What do you guys think of, of that? Just a just an innate tendency toward rationalism. Mm hmm. I, I, can I just jump in here real quick, maybe? Take it away. Um, I, I guess I'm wondering why we're, tr in the Reformed tradition anyway, why you would be trying yeah. to so-called solve this problem that doesn't even strike me as a problem. Right. And then to solve it in a way that creates problems, I, it just it seems strange. And let me just be a little bit more specific. Uh, so if you're talking about the issue of like God repenting or the language of God repenting in the Old Testament— I mean, uh, we have a, a long tradition of, of understanding that and an anthropo uh, anthropomorphic uh, uh, yeah. way. Yeah. There's a long tradition of under understanding that that the issues at stake have to be uh, addressed in human language and, and in a way that's understandable for humans in a way that we can grasp and that makes sense to us. So uh, that's a little bit puzzling when you have the resources, the rich resources of the Reformed tradition, in particular our stream of the Reformed tradition. It just seems like yeah. you would look at correlativism, mutualism of all kinds, and you would just agree with Van Til, like, we don't need it. You know, no thanks. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. The, no, the resources of the confession should be that's enough. That's an excellent point. Uh, and a, a, another uh, a complementary point, um, Adam's always on point. Um, uh, so a complementary point to what both of you brothers have said, I think that um, the logic of mystery is that it provides the proper parameters for the expression of worship. Um, we worship God who remains incomprehensible in his relation to creation, and the precise locus of that incomprehensibility is that God remains independent while in relation, immutable, uh, while um, interfacing, interacting with the creature, um, self-contained while condescended. And the, um, the, the, the reflex of a pagan mind is to resolve all mystery, to make everything absolutely translucent to the intellect. And the, but, but the propension of the Christian uh, who has been redeemed uh, by the grace of God that is in Jesus Christ, is worship. And so we worship God in his incomprehensible fullness and, and say that that attempt to try to resolve the mystery univocally is precisely the problem in the Garden of Eden called sin. Uh, and and I, I, so I do think that the beauty of our Reformed confessional theology is that it so seamlessly helps us worship and the parameters of mystery serve the worship of the incomprehensible God. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, brother. Adam, we're going to take a question from Kevin. So if you don't mind, Thanks, I Adam. might uh, 
It might, uh, well, I don't even know if I get you. You might be with us forever. Here we go. <laughs> We're going to bring on Kevin, though, for sure. I, I, I'd i love not to say goodbye to Adam, but uh, Kevin here, I'm going to invite you to the stage. You can ask his question. I have other questions, too, for later. What, yeah. <laughs> let's let's bring it on. Uh, and uh, I, I have one for you, too. What's uh, is it, Are you going with the over or the under with uh, the blue against Colorado State to, on Saturday? And then my second question for you, who's going to who's gonna start the third game? <laughs> Adam's one of my Michigan buddies, so anyway. Kevin, you there? You might need to connect. Um, here we Can go. you hear me? There you are. Hey, how you doing, gotcha, buddy? brother. Good to see you. Hey, brothers. Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah. We got gotcha. you. Take it away. You, Kevin. Hey, Kevin. Yeah, fire, well, fire away with your my, question if, you, if you'd like. My question is, I'll just I'll just read it off the screen, is many friends in the wider reform camp and baptistic circles have recently vocalized concerns with Van Til and his use of absolute personality. Mm-hmm. And, I'll, and I'll say this, it's out of nowhere. <laughs> you, you'll be on, I don't know, Twitter, or it'll be a conversation suddenly, well, Van Til denies the Trinity. Uh, they caricature it, in my opinion. Um Obviously and clearly he doesn't, and I'm just wondering what might be some good talking points. And and I'll, and I'll tell you this: uh, I I even see it in the closest circles, mm-hmm. faithful brothers um, ab- above the grade, but they 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 have tendency to say, "Oh, don't mention Van Til. Let's not talk about that," mm. because of that one point. And if you don't know anything about Van Til. You'll throw that one out there. Yeah, either that or he denies f- natural <laughs> revelation. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, let's not go that one. Right. We should put that one on the list. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's on there. <laughs> so uh, I was just asking what might what might be helpful uh, at the Sunday school level, yeah. at, in a in just normal dialogue to sort of disarm that univocal way of thinking about personality. Yeah. Um, beautiful question. Uh, we've kind of, Kevin's been in some of the cohorts, and so we've discussed this at a little higher level. But if it's a Sunday school level, um, you know, I, I think you could say this if someone says, I'm really scared of, of reading Van Til, say, oh, well, then let's read Bavink. That's what I would say first. Do you have Bavink? Do you have Bavink's Reformed Dogmatics? Or uh, Dr. Wynn has written a wonderful introduction to the wonderful works of God. And Bavink uses the same kind of language. In fact, you could say, uh, St. Augustine before Bavink had spoken in similar terms. So I I would say to to the person, the first Sunday school level answer is, well, you know, before you think about Van Til, just realize there's this Augustinian tradition where Augustine used very similar language. And Herman Bavink quotes Augustine uh, along the same lines, and really all that's happening is Van Til is appropriating the insights of the Augustinian and Calvinist Dutch tradition, or Dutch Calvinist tradition. Um, and that that's my, my quick first answer. Quick second answer is um, I would just say something like, um, at, at the practical level, you know, have you ever prayed um, to God? Let's just say you're not a really refined Trinitarian. Let's not get all sophisticated. Pray to the Father, um, through the Son, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. Yes, you've done that. But have you ever prayed to God? Um, and and um, if, if someone says yes to that, say, well, one of the reasons why you pray to God is because you know that God himself is one God— that he has one will, that he has one decree, and that he hears you in the unity of his deity. You can pray to the one living and true God with confidence that this one God hears you. And if you if you start to incorporate that into the piety of prayer life, 
you can realize that while you're praying to the Father in the uh, Son and by the power of the Holy Spirit, you're at the same time praying to, and here's the key, one undivided Godhead, one God who hears and answers in the unity of his being. And that that one who hears, that one who responds is not an abstract principle. It's not electricity. It's, it's, it's a personal God. And I think at the Sunday school level, if you can get those two things across, you know, there's this ancient tradition that speaks this way. Ventil's not new. And in your prayer life, you pray to one God because he is not three but one, and the one God hears and responds and loves in the unity of his being, which is not an impersonal, abstract thing. It's personal. That's the Sunday school level beginner's response that I would make, something along those lines. One is a little bit of a tour, a soft tour of church history. The other one is reminding you about your prayer life that I think might turn up something really beautiful there. Uh, but that's just others. Oh, okay. That, or, or Kevin, that is, what do you really, think? That is very helpful. I, I think one of the things that I tend to do is I go the other way, and I talk about how, well, what are the consequences of ending up at a sort of a soft tritheism where you take these persons and you abstract them from one another to such a degree because you're militating for these three persons in such a way? Well, that's that's the opposite. God... God uh, like you mentioned in your book, God, uh, God doesn't have personality. He is absolute personality. So that's the important distinction so that they don't end up. And, and I, it's an idea I've been fostering for a while. I have a lot of research to do before I can give it any, any flesh and bone. But I, I think there's a lot of soft tritheism, unawares, um, all about. So thank you. That is helpful. That's a good point, Kevin. Thank you, brother. I think we we find some of those errors. It's not entirely unrelated to some of the eternal subordination of the sun stuff that we were dealing with three, four, or five years ago mm-hmm. in evangelicalism. That's a good point. Something to think about. And uh, to tie it back to the biblicism, certainly we need to be reading and understanding our theology, you know, in according to the historic creeds and confessions. It doesn't make the creeds and confessions infallible, but... Uh, if we go, fo- uh, uh, you know, a field of them, we really got to question ourselves and wonder what's wonder what's going on there. Thanks, Kevin. That's good. We're going to go over to Benjamin. Uh, let me work on getting this up and see if we can get his question on point. So it appears as if, if you want to game the system, you get in here and you ask a question, and then people can vote on it. And if it votes on it, I've got a filter, and it puts your question to the top. So uh-huh. wow. this is how this works. We'll see if, if he wants to come up or not. Ooh. Yeah, it's a good one. It looks like Benjamin's connecting. Question on theological retrieval. I just was uh, organizing a bookshelf today over here to my left, and I was going through the retrieval section. So <laughs> it had been a while since I had retrieved them from the shelf. Um, am I am I coming yeah, up? Yeah, we I can hear through? you. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. How's awesome. it going? We're going to put you on the big screen here if you can. Um, great. If you great. want, you can turn your. My, vi- you don't feel they I have was to. Just gonna say, I can't figure out how to get my video to work. Okay. Unfortunately, I apologize for hey, that. Hey, no worries. I think at the bottom of your screen, uh, toward the bottom of the window, there should be a, a video camera icon. But if not, we can hear you in the time being. There you go. Yeah. What? Right, there we go. Good to see yeah. you, Benjamin. Yeah. Hey, hey Benjamin. Yeah, thank you for thank you for this. Um, and yeah. yeah, my question um, it's just it, it got touched on a little bit with the last one, but just um, yeah, related to the Reformed tradition, um, how do we how do we understand Vantel's doctrine specifically? We can look at the Trinity, but even more just broadly, his theological system in light of theological retrieval. Um, I've just kind of finished reading uh, Reformed Catholicity. Yeah. Um, by Alan and Swain, and just kind of that, um, that's a lot of the pushback in the in the conversations I have, is just the, the claim that he falls totally outside of that stream. Um, and so just kind of how, what would be a, a basic argument to to establish his place in the in the Reformed tradition? How would, how would a basic, uh, basic blueprint of that argument look? 
Sure. That that's a Benjamin. That's a great question. There are. I'm terrible about giving uh, multi-tiered long answers. I'm going to try not to do that. Let me give uh, a couple of brief ones. Uh, the first one is that uh, I believe I try to frame the third chapter on Van Til's Doctrine of the Trinity by saying that Van Til is actually the most ecumenically reformed theologian I'm aware of in the 20th century because he is self-consciously integrating the continental Dutch and English Puritan Trinitarian traditions. He's taking the very best of Bavink, the very best of the Westminster Standards as interpreted by A. A. Hodge, and in chapter 17 of his Intro to Systematic Theology, he is integrating both. And so uh, there's a deep ecumenical reformed uh, propension in Van Til. And I don't know anyone who's saying Bavink is outside of the reformed tradition or the Westminster standards, you know, are somehow not reformed. That English Puritan document where Van Til begins his exposition of the Trinity. The second one, and I'll be super brief here. Um, when, when we're, when, okay, I'll be brief for me, which might be a little long, but I'm, I'll try to hustle. But um, the, when Van Til is presenting his overarching Trinitarianism, he is an Augustinian Calvinist, cites Augustine as being so useful in opposing all forms of subordinationism, affirms Calvin's autothean Trinitarian logic, saying it is the consistent expression of Nicene uh, doctrine of homoousios, that it avoids subordinationism more effectively than anything up to that point in the the tradition. And then in light of that, takes the du continental Dutch and English Puritan traditions. And so K Van Til is actually doing the kind of reformed retrieval we're looking for. He's integrating mm. various strands from Augustine, Calvin, Dutch, English Puritan traditions. And what that helps you recognize is that when you're, when you're seeking to retrieve one thing you need to, to keep in mind is that there's a Catholic Reformed tradition that is developing from the patristics through the medieval period up to and through the Reformation. But there's also a self-conscious programmatic Roman Catholic tradition that's developing. And what I think Van Til helps us do, Voss certainly helps us with this, is that there is a very clear continuity between Catholic and Reformed theology, lowercase c, ecumenical, creedal theology. But there are some fundamental differences. I've got an essay coming out on this in a while uh, between Thomas and Voss when it comes to a series of differences uh, that range from Trinitarian processions to the nature of the image of God to the nature mm -hmm. of grace and so on. And those differences... I think often, like in that great tradition model of, of Carter and so on, the differences between Catholic and Roman Catholic get blurred, and that, I think, can often lead people to seek to retrieve Thomas and join him to Voss, like John Fesco has done recently, in a way that winds up creating some confusion. So those are some, just a, a couple of thoughts. There's more to say, but... I think the the bottom line is that if you know my 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 simple answer to people is Van Til outside the tradition Tola Lege, just take up and read um, chapters. Just start with chapter seventeen of the IST, and it's self authenticating and indisputable that he's <laughs> he's he's doing that. Now you might not you, you might not like the Continental Dutch and the English Puritan, but if you don't, then we we've got we've got a bigger conversation to have. Right. Mm -hmm. That's really, in, yeah, in many ways, Benjamin, the case, uh, you know, of ma several chapters in this book. So, yeah, thanks, Lane, for that really good uh, summary. But, uh, you know, when we really connect it, this, Benjamin, this is something that's interesting. When you get people that are that are antagonizing you over Van Til supposedly not being part of the tradition, ask them if they like Bavink. Yeah, I'd just start with that because Bavink is like the theologian du jour. Everyone loves Bavink now. If you're reformed, he's cool. Van Til's not cool. Thomas is cool for some reason, but Van Til's not. And so 
ask if they like Bavink. Ask ask them if they've read Bavink on the Trinity. And then, you know, go here and look at the parts where Lane compares uh, Bavink's works and Voss's works on the Trinity to what Van Til is saying. It's the same thing. You know, it, 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 almost uh, you'd say, well, Van Til introduces a lot of novel language, like new phrases. Actually, not really. <laughs> <laughs> like, like Van, Van yeah. Til is very thoughtful and creative in in um, connecting things, but in terms of coming up with these ideas of himself, I it, it's hard to say that he did on on most any of these things that people have an issue with. So, to turn the tables on someone, you could say, well, if you got a problem with Van Til on on absolute personality, well, you got a problem with Bavik, and. That's going to be a problem if you want to be cool on Twitter. Uh, so it just is. I mean, that's, that's, that's you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but there, there's also a social aspect to who you align with, which is also ties in with, you know, the question before about theological retrieval. You know, retrieval, why even call it that? I mean, it's useful, but haven't we always or shouldn't we always be reading the lessons of the past and trying to apply them today? Mm-hmm. But why call it retrieval? Because it's cool, right? <laughs> like, I'm sorry. Isn't 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 the reformed tradition by definition a movement of retrieval, in the best sense of the term? Yeah. Right. And and the concern in our contemporary setting with the retrieval movement, at least mine, is that too often when we think about reformed Catholicity, the R gets really small and the C gets really big. <laughs> 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 and I want to. I want to be in favor of reform Catholicity, but with a big R and a little C. Yeah, I hear you. That's good. That's, That's good. A good way to put it. We're going to try to go to some more questions, Benjamin. Let's follow up sometime. We really love to talk to you some more. Yeah, I appreciate you. the question. Yeah. I do also need to yeah, mention. Thank you, so much. you bet. Uh, it's been our pleasure. I need to mention to some folks that we we are working with a limited version of Airmeet tonight. So we're doing this kind of as a test. If this goes well, then I'm inclined to subscribe, you know, if we can get Lane's uh, technical issues so that we can have unlimited length events. But this is part of the problem why the event has been limited to 100 people, no more than 100. But also there's a time limit. So we're like in the, in the you know, back in the old days before we knew that the earth was round, or is it? Um, that you would go, you know, you'd worry about going to the edge of the world and seeing what happens if you go over the edge. So I don't know what happens when we get to the edge of the time on this. What's the time came in an hour? Yeah. Um, so 730, I think we might have on the schedule, we have another 10 minutes for this session, but we can run over because I just booked some extra time. So we have, I think we have 25 minutes, which is plenty, Okay. but I'm just warning folks. I don't, I don't know what happens if we go to the edge of the world <laughs> in air meet. But let's go to Trevor if Trevor's there. Uh, Trevor, are you there? I'm bringing you up to the stage here. Trevor hasn't read the book yet, but he's had a preview of it to some degree and has a question about autothean personhood. So I think it, and it would be a, a useful a useful question to answer. There he is. How you doing? Uh-huh. Doing pretty well. Can can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can. Oh, yeah. Welcome, yes, Trevor. Good it's good to see, see you. Oh, yeah, it's good to see you. I woke up from a nap at like eight sixteen. I was like, oh no, I register for <laughs> nice. this event. Let me get in it. Um, so, yeah, I just got on the campus. So, nice. Yeah. Um, I don't see my question on screen anymore. Oh, I'm sorry. I, yeah. Was, was I, all good. Okay. Do you remember it? Um, was there's a question about autothan yeah. personhood? I wanted to get your face expanded in the in the right. instead of the words, but I apologize. Go ahead. Sure. So, yeah, I was just curious about Van Til's doctrine of autothan personhood. We've heard a little bit about it, um, his historical theological context in the Reformed tradition, um, but at least for me personally, it's it seems useful. In, in modern Catholic theology, it's sort of one of my research interests. I haven't done much research. I'm only starting seminary, but um, yeah, thinking about guys like Rahner and his doctrine of of divine persons and their communication, it's a lot different than what we might think about uh, a traditional Reformed Orthodox doctrine of the Trinity. So with that, 
I'll, I'll give it back over. Um, just a preview of his Dr. Walkley and personhood, where, he, where, he, where he's getting it from, what are the features of it. Yeah. Read it before I read, yeah. the, read the book. I, I and even, yeah, the, polem too. the polemical context, too, might be handy. Exactly. Like, why is, yeah. why is he dealing with this, Lane? Good question. Right. Good yeah. question, Trevor. Let me suggest this this volume, Trevor, as a background for the book. Mm. This is Brandon Ellis's. Yeah, yeah. You can take a picture. It's see, within, it's within reach of my chair, too, Lane. There it is. See that? I always keep it within reach. You guys Can't at the other there end is. of, there like, is. on two ends of Can't. a wormhole or something? <laughs> it's like, pass the book Calvin. down. <laughs> Calvin's classical <laughs> Trinitarianism. Carlton, Hollywood Square is here. <laughs> there, it comes, <laughs> watch this. there it comes, right? There we go. Okay. There it is. Okay. Now, Carlton, give that back. Okay. There we go. Now, um, okay. Sorry. That was wasting your time, and I apologize. For that. that's, that's really, really so bad. Um, he that's covers fine. he covers a th – that is the finest volume covering the, the polemical context – of some of Calvin's debates with those who accused him of heresy and um, some who were leveraging um, Nicene Trinitarianism in ways that Calvin thought uh, led towards subordinationism. Now, to, to, to keep from giving you the, the full exposition of what um, I put in the book, um, let me just put it this way, and, and I, I, I don't know. I think this might be a helpful way of putting it, Trevor. You can tell me. Autotheos, the concept of autotheos, entails that one subsistent person, let's say the Son, he subsists as the whole and undivided essence of God without remainder. He is not sustained in his essence by another Trinitarian person. Um, he does not receive it. And he is not sustained in it, in the essence, by another Trinitarian person. So he is – I'm going to put this in a semi-popular way because I put it more technically in the book, and I don't want to just repeat all the details that are in the book. But he is just as simple, just as underived in his deity as the Father. Um, I'll try it one, one other way. It's not the case that the Father confers the essence by way of communication on the Son, and the Son somehow passively receives it. Calvin's wanting to get away from anything that would hint that the Son's deity is, because communicated, derived. Derived deity is no deity for Calvin. And so he, uh, when Calvin is... Uh, talking about the fact that the son is not sustained in his essence by another person. It's because he does not derive by way of communication his essence from another. And if you take it that way, understand it in that light, Calvin is not denying Nicaea. Calvin is saying this is the strongest conceivable way of expressing Nicene Trinitarianism, that the Son exhaustively and without any qualifications is homoousios with the Father. That's what he's after, and he, he fears that if you talk about a donation of the essence or a fountain of deity uh, that comes from the Father to the Son, he fears that the specter of subordinationism will emerge at some point. And so I chronicle Van Til's dependence on Warfield. I give a little bit fuller explication of the logic of Autotheos than, than Van Til himself does. But that's the, the, the simplest way, no pun intended on simplicity, that's the simplest way I know how to, to try to get at it, Trevor. Does that help some? Yeah, for sure. For sure. That definitely helps. And yeah, it's... Yeah. It's always interesting to think about it in the terms of uh, of uh, eternal eternal begottenness, and I always hear I've heard some Reformed people steer away from that more traditional language and see that term, the the Greek term. I forget what the Greek term for begotten is, and they'll they'll make it Monogamous. seem like it's not, not it's, it's more uniqueness. Or one of a kindness. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah that's an exegetical to... debate as well. Yeah, but so. I think 
It's interesting. I think Trevor, Trevor, you can hang on to eternal begottenness with all your worth and hold fast to autotheon personhood, because yeah. that's exactly what Calvin does. In, in fact, yeah. let me give you a quick quote from Calvin, just to get it from the horse's mouth. He sure. says, um, he says. They contend, the, his, the, those, those he's uh, opposing, um, they contend that because he is of the substance of the Father, he is not of himself since he has his principium from another. And then Calvin says, but when apart from consideration of the person we are speaking of his divinity— or which is the same thing, simpliciter of the essence, I say that it is truly predicated of it, that it is a se ipso, from itself. And so um, he's saying when we conceive of the Son in relation to the Father, we can say his person is from the Father, but when we consider his essence simpliciter, it is from himself simply because he is God. Um, undivided. So there, there's a there's a th th I, I provide a lot of quotations from Calvin and a lot of yeah. quotations from Moorfield trying to explicate that concept in the book. Yeah, it's great. And um, I don't know, I'm going to take up too much time, but I, I Canda did mention something helpful about Van Til's polemical context and a bit of who he might have been yeah. dealing with in his time. Why it was an important topic to explicitly discuss and try to argue mm -hmm. so, you got any thoughts about that yeah who has he responded to land why is why is that such a feature for van till well here's here's what's so neat about it trevor this is this is a fascinating thing to recognize on the one side i have a section where i deal with it on the one side he's dealing with boston personalists who want mm -hmm. to affirm um the the um unity of God as a person in such a way that compromises the personal distinctions within the Godhead. So for them, God is a an absolute person devoid of that classical Trinitarian understanding of three distinct persons who subsist as one essence. They just want a unity of personhood. And then those Trinitarian hypostases, they, they don't emphasize much at all. In fact, they, they decenter that. Gordon Clark, on the other hand, so focuses on the Trinity that he says each of the persons, Trinitarian persons, is distinguished, listen to this, by a discrete bundle of thought. Gordon Clark says, I, the Father, am a discrete bundle of thoughts. I, the Son, am a discrete bundle of thoughts. I, the Spirit, are a discrete bundle of thoughts, so that they are conceived of as separate bundles. Take a bunch of straws and put some rubber bands around them, thought bundle one, that's the Father. Take some more straws, put rubber bands around them, thought bundle two, that's the Son. Take some more straws, rubber bands around them, thought bundle three, that's the Holy Spirit. Those are three separate bundles of straws. Well, Clark says, Trinity is just that simple. Three bundles of thoughts. And then what does he say about the essence? He says it is mute or unconscious substance. So, so Clark depersonalizes the essence in order to affirm three separate thought bundles. The Boston personalists have the essence as personal but deny in any meaningful way, traditional Trinitarian distinctions, uh, relations of subsistence. And so Van Til is saying no to both by affirming a series of orthodox Trinitarian categories such as unity of essence, incommunicable personal properties, relations of personal subsistence, and relations of personal coherence. Yep. And once you see what the Boston personalists and the neo-evangelical rationalists are doing, Van Til explodes as the, as the orthodox Trinitarian theologian who properly locates my mystery, as Carlton was talking about, and doesn't go in one of those two rationalistic errors. That's very good. Great. Thanks for yeah. the question, Trevor. Uh, we're gonna. We've got. I did get a warning. We've got six minutes. I'm gonna try to fit one more question okay. in. But uh, thanks for sure. thanks for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, let's thanks, follow brother. up. Appreciate you guys. Yeah. Thank you. We, we uh, let's try to fit in. I'm gonna go to Adam McNeil here quick, and then if we can, we'll try to. Uh, we got one from Graham and Joshua. We might have to do quick hits. Uh, 
I'll do. You, I will go under thirty seconds. <laughs> we might have to do some. We'll ask. Uh, we'll invite uh, Adam up here, but we might have to just uh, uh, do the questions without uh, inviting folks to the stage. I apologize, uh, Joshua and Graham. We'll see if we can get to you. Five minutes. Warning. Ed, ed, edge of the world approaching. Uh, let's see here. Oh, I'm sorry. Invite to stage. Here we go. In the words of Wang Chung, on the edge of oblivion <laughs> and all the world is Babylon, a ship of fools sailing on. We can have a party tonight. <laughs> if that's hey, the if case. If we get kicked off, it's been, it's been fun, guys. It's very Ecclesiastics, uh, Ecclesiastes, you know. If we're at the edge of oblivion, you might as well party. Have a party tonight. Everybody have fun tonight. Everybody Wang Chung tonight. Um, Everybody. It has been a good time, Carlton, but thank you. Adam there? Oh, thanks. Yes, I'm sir. Good. Adam. Hey, buddy. Speak good to quickly. see you, Adam. Speak quickly, Adam. Yes. <laughs> Make haste. Speak. Make haste. <laughs> All right. All right. The edge of the world approaches. Problem. Yes. Yeah, well, we'll won't get to the edge. <laughs> I was asking about how conceiving of God's being as covenantal relates to the denial of common grace, which I believe is characteristic of Huxima and other Protestant reformed and how Van Til would deal with that, that dual error. Good one. This is going to relate to a, a course I just finished editing today. The uh, fourth Van Til course. Lane, do you have oh, a, Oh my goodness. You have a lead yes, on this? Well, I, I, I can put this, uh, uh, very basically that the, um, God's being as covenantal, is going to make um, everything that God does necessarily a revelation of His um, of, of 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 sovereign grace. Good to see, you. good to see, you, brother. Um, um, and so I, I think that Van Til is going to distinguish between the or operations of personal existence and the operations of uh, of of uh, uh, in the economy, operations in the Trinity, operations outside the Trinity, and um, he's going to affirm that that. Um, well, Adam, I, I'm going to be honest with you, brother. I'm not exactly sure how to relate those two. The more I'm thinking about it, I know Van Til would deny both. Um, I'm not certain. I'm going to defer to Camden or Carlton to take a crack at it. I'm not sure how Hooksima's doctrine of um, the being of God as covenantal entails his denial of common grace. I could explain separately how Van Til denies both. Does anyone have a shot at that? I... Man, I, I just remember reading Ralph Smith on Van Til and Paradox, and he's tried to say that Van Til says God's being itself is covenantal. But in terms mm -hmm. of a connection to a denial of common grace, the only thing that conceivably comes to mind is that somehow Hooksima orients the very identity of the triune God exclusively to the salvation of the elect, like some hyper understanding of the pactum salutis that has no room for a universal offer of the gospel or even a, a disposition of grace and kindness in any sense of the term toward the world at large. That's the only thing that I can mm. kind of think of, but I, I haven't read Hoaxima on covenantal being of God. I just yeah. I'm more familiar with the denial of common grace in terms of a hyper Calvinistic outlook of the offer of the gospel. Now, so. I did, yeah, I did read Ralph Smith on that. That's that's good, Carlton. I I, I think maybe um, what Van Til would want to say is that the, the only thing I can say is that the decree differentiates absolutely. And then history differentiates incrementally, and it seems like um, Hooksima might want to try to deny that kind of progressive differentiation where the earlier grace, in Van Til's terms, where the earlier grace of God's covenantal – uh-oh, less than one minute – where God's favor, undifferentiated covenantal favor before the fall, still continues to have implications after the fall. I think maybe – 30 seconds. So, um, Adam, that required a longer answer that I was not able to get into and develop well. Thank you, Carlton. Guys? Leave it to Adam you. McNeil to dive into the deep end. Right yeah, here. that's, that's really good. End. 
Well, I do want to Sorry, say, well, Adam, here, this man. is really, really good. But I do, in the remaining nine seconds, I want to thank everybody for for participating in this. I think guys, we had a really fun time, and we certainly yeah, want to continue great. this. So let's follow up, everyone. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you.